I'm going to talk uh, today about climate change as it directly impacts our national parks. I'm not here to sort of convince you that uh, climate change is real, but to actually detail the challenges we are facing in the national park system uh, from climate change. It is actually challenging sort of the fundamental paradigm by which we manage our national parks and have managed them for almost 100 years. We will be celebrating our centennial in 2016. The National Park Service will be 100 years old. These two guys really, um, in many ways, are the foundation of conservation writ large uh, in the United States. Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir met about the turn of the century in Yosemite National Park. You can see uh, Yosemite Falls there in the background, and it's a great story. President of the United States goes to Yosemite. He insisted that uh, John Muir be with him, and um, there was, a, of course, an entourage, which Roosevelt ditched uh, almost immediately and took off uh, th through the mountains with, uh, with John Muir, spent the night out. His Secret Service were looking for him. And ultimately, though, these two individuals not only formed a bond of of friendship and mutual respect, but basically created the sort of founding principles upon which the national parks have been managed uh, pretty much for the last 100 years. And that is that these places would be preserved unimpaired um, for future generations, that these were set aside specifically to be protected uh, not only for uh, current generations, but for future generations as well. And so since 1916, the National Park Service has protected pretty much everything um, within the boundaries of these national parks, whether it was wildlife or archaeological sites or, you know, uh, birds or plants or whatever. That was sort of our, our core value, and, and the bison of Yellowstone sort of in many ways uh, exemplify that. Now, let's say in the first part of the century, though, um, our concept of conservation um, uh, was a little bit skewed. We, um, we protected the, the elk and the deer and we controlled the predators and examples like this were pretty common of, of that uh, we were killing off uh, the wolves. Um, Aldo Leopold, uh, sort of one of the other founders of conservation, uh, had the line that said uh, when intelligent um, management, intelligent tinkering requires that you save all the parts. And, Initially, we really weren't sort of saving all the parts. But about the mid-60s or so, or so, Aldo Leopold's son, Starker Leopold, A. Starker Leopold, was the science advisor to the Secretary of the Interior. And Starker said he was challenged uh, by essentially an overpopulation of elk in the Grand Tetons National Park area. And so he recommended a different paradigm uh, for managing the national park system. He suggested that we should what he called create vignettes of primitive America, that we really should be allowing nature uh, to, to be the dominant force and that the, that the human influence should be minimal and we should bring back uh, all the parts that we had either eliminated or had been uh, extirpated uh, due to human influence. And so this policy was implemented in the 60s, uh, known as the Leopold Report after uh, Starker Leopold. And it has led the national park system since the 60s to a, essentially a paradigm of bringing all the parts back and allowing nature to prevail. And it drove us to the kinds of policies that implemented, you'll see here with uh, the return of the wolves to, to Yellowstone, uh, to reintroduce this natural predator into the system. And, and the results have been obviously very positive, both for the ecosystem uh, as well as for public enjoyment. The wolves there are incredibly popular. It also drove us to bring back natural processes as well, such as fire. Uh, fire plays a very, very important role in ecosystem dynamics, particularly in the West. There are certain forest types like ponderosa pine have to have fire. They, if they don't have fire, the forest is doomed. And so bringing fire back into the system was another product of this sort of new paradigm that uh, Leopold gave us as well. It also challenged us to take on the control of exotics. Um, these are species that invade into the national park system from, that are brought here from other parts of the world. In this case, this is buffalo grass. It is a African Asian native that was brought into the Southwest. It has spread uh, throughout the Southwest. In this case, you see it in, 
in Saguaro National Park. And the trouble, of course, is one, it outcompetes native species, but it also carries fire. And so it's highly flammable species, and fire can rip through a giant uh, saguaro uh, stand and, uh, and kill the saguaros. This paradigm that we established in the mid-60s um, really has been well accepted by the American public. They come to our national parks, they learn about natural processes, they learn about native species, they want to experience it, and their own impact has been managed, like in this case where they're essentially walking on a boardwalk through uh, a native forest. Um, this um, concept has, has been received very popular uh, appeal, not only here in the United States, but has been a standard uh, for national parks around the world. In the mid-1980s, I've been in the Park Service almost 40 years, in the mid-1980s, I was the park biologist at Crater Lake National Park and North Cascades National Park in the Cascade Mountains. And Crater Lake National Park has is, is got to be one of the snowiest places um, on the planet. Um, uh, my house, which was at almost 6,000 feet, uh, I had 22 feet of snow in my yard on Easter Sunday. Um, the first winter I was there, I had to shovel out the second story windows to have light in the house. Um, <laughs> And, but one of my jobs was a snow survey. And so the snow survey is where you go out onto these deep snow packs and you take this tube that you see, you drive it down through the snow till it hits soil, you pull it out and you weigh it. And you do this on a regular basis and it gives you a measure of the water content of snow. And the water content of snow in the Cascades or any mountain range is incredibly important because that is essentially the storage reservoir for the downstream uh, users, whether it's cities or agriculture or wildlife and fish and all of those kinds of things. So this is a very important database um, that uh, measures uh, water content. Well, over that decade period when I was doing these kinds of surveys, we began to see a trend the water content of the snowpack of the Cascades was in decline. We were still getting a lot of snow, but it was a drier snow, which meant that the atmosphere was holding more of that moisture and not letting it come down as, as a consequence. This was an indicator of climate change. We also began to see in other of our national parks direct impacts from climate change. And this is Mount Rainier National Park where I served as the park superintendent. Historically, from a climate standpoint, um, we would have rain on snow in the spring. And that snowpack would serve as a big sponge, just soaking up that rainfall and then letting it trickle out through the summer. And suddenly we got a switch. We got a switch from rain on snow in the spring to rain on snow in the fall. And when rain falls in the Cascades in the fall, it melts the snow and we get enormous flooding. And Resources such as in this case uh, were incredibly damaged. We lost about $36 million worth of facilities uh, in, at Mount Rainier in one, one event. We also began to see the effects in some classic national parks. This is Glacier National Park. This is the Shepherd Glacier. You can see on one slide uh, about 100 years ago, fairly large glacier. And then most recently, the glacier is basically gone. The scientists are telling us that within 20 years, Glacier National Park will no longer have any glaciers. We are also seeing direct scientific research indicating climate change happening in the national parks. This is Joseph Grinnell. He is a visionary scientist at University of California, Berkeley, and about, 19, about the turn of the century, he did eight years of research in Yosemite National Park where he went out and actually trapped animals at particular elevations throughout the park. And he's an incredibly good note taker so good that scientists 90 years later could go back and camp in the exact same campsite and come back and sample the exact same routes that he did. And the results are quite disturbing. What they found were that chipmunks and mice and voles that Grinnell caught were no longer in the same locations. They had moved up the mountain over, in some cases, over a thousand feet. This little guy is a pika. Pika is in a relative of the rabbit, and if you go up into the Cascades and sit out on a, on a beautiful sunny afternoon on a rocky scree slope, these little guys will come out and they, uh, they have a, a sound like a squeaky door hinge, and they gather up seeds and grass and create little haystacks inside the, the rocks that, the, that they 
uh, need for winter survival. These two are moving up the mountain. And the problem is if you move up so far, you get to the top and you have no place to go except for extinction. What about the species that can't migrate? This is the general Sherman tree, uh, a giant sequoia. And the giant sequoias exist only in a small niche uh, in Yosemite and Sequoia and a few other places in the Sierras. This tree is 2,700 years old. In other words, this tree was a seedling uh, when King uh, Leonidas was taking on the Persians in the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC. I had a workshop uh, that I held in the early 2000s with my staff uh, in uh, the Pacific about climate change. And my science advisor said, at what point are you going to be ready to put a sprinkler system on the giant sequoias? Or perhaps even more difficult, where do we plant giant sequoias in the north so that citizens living on this planet 2,000 years from now will be able to experience giant sequoias. What is our capacity to predict that location that will be viable for this species 2,000 years from now? It's not all about natural resources either. This is Fort Jefferson. Fort Jefferson sits at the southern end of the Florida Keys on the Dry Tortugas. It is basically at sea level. You can see it has a moat around it, but that's the ocean uh, beside it. Its most famous resident was Dr. Samuel Mudd, who, who repaired the leg of John Wilkes Booth, who jumped onto the stage not far from here right after assassinating Abraham Lincoln. The problem with this site is that sea level is rising, and it may uh, take this place out. And at another workshop we had recently, um, one of our culture resource specialists said, you know, we can document this site. We can uh, register it. We can take photographs of it and then let it go. And in that same uh, meeting, a biologist also talking about climate change turned to the cultural person and said, at least you have a process by which to say goodbye. This is Isle Royal. Isle Royal is a wilderness solitude park in the middle of Lake Superior. And it is also the site of the longest study of predator-prey relationships in the world, moose and wolves. Now, the challenge we have at Isle Royal is that wolves got to this island by walking across a frozen lake. And we have not had a new wolf come on to Isle Royal since 1990. So we are now, now, now down to just a few wolves left. And their uh, genetic diversity is actually uh, becoming compromised because of that. These two species live in complete dynamic in terms of the, the wolves eat moose and the moose eat the vegetation. With climate change, the opportunity for new wolves to enter the island is very limited anymore. So the question we are facing now is, based on our current policies, is we would let the wolves just wink out because that would be the natural thing, except nature is no longer natural because of climate change. If we let the wolves wink out, the moose population is going to explode, and they will eat the island down to the nubbins, and then they will massively die off in a starvation event. So we're challenged with this new paradigm. Do we introduce new wolves uh, to Isle Royal? Um, or one scientist said, Isle Royal in the future is not going to support moose uh, and wolves anyway. You just take them all out and you introduce caribou and lynx. The challenge we have uh, in the national park system right now is to adapt uh, to this new paradigm. And uh, let me just say, I don't have the answers to these questions, but we're working on it. And um, we've got some of the best minds in the country working with us today to create a new paradigm of adaptation to climate change. And just like in the days of Roosevelt and Muir, I believe that the national park system uh, will help this country adapt uh, to this new realm of climate change. Thank you.